edition of Seniors Today. I'm your host, Tom Barty, and we're lucky enough to have with us here today the Chief of the Fire Department, Mr. Paige Meyer. Welcome, Paige. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks. Um, so, how are things going in the Fire Department nowadays? Well, um, right now, great. We're doing uh, great things in the Fire Department. We're going to talk about a few of them. Uh, our morale's high, our guys are working hard, and, and, and men and women are working hard, and uh, things, things are great right now. Well, that's terrific. I know that um, it's, been a, it's been a difficult four or five years for the city of Vallejo. Absolutely. And, and the fire department was definitely impacted as much, if not more, than a lot of the other departments at City Hall. We had closure of numerous fire stations, and uh, fortunately, we've been able to bring things back a little bit. I think we just re recently reopened another fire station. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. We, uh, uh, fortunately, we uh, were able to uh, get some safer grant money, which is staffing adequate fire and emergency resources. It's a FEMA grant, a federal grant. That's allowed us to hire a total of 12 firefighters. It's an in, in excess of $2 million given to the city a year. So during this transitional period of that that money, we've been able to open up Station 25 on Mini, um, Mini Drive in North Vallejo, and that's been opening and closing since the first of the year, but will be open permanently on uh, July 1st. So we're looking forward to that, and, and it was a tough couple of years, or, or several years, but, you know, a testament goes out to uh, the folks in the firehouse, uh, the firefighters, they, uh, they've got a passion for what they do, and, and uh, they've been able to do a great job for the citizens, and, and it's been, it's been a, a good ride for them. Yeah, I know that the Vallejo Fire Department has a terrific reputation regionally for not just for their passion for the job, but their training and their dedication and commitment, and I know that's really helped us through the last few years. And, uh, you know, a lot of people at first were concerned about the reduction of of, of, the, of the force and the number of stations, and I think uh, we were able to do a terrific job at uh, reallocating our resources and uh, make, making sure that if we had to close the station, it was one that wouldn't impact response time significantly, and I, I think we're able to continue to protect the safety of the citizens, both from the EMS perspective and the fire perspective over the, you know, the last few years. And, and we're just getting better now. Yeah, and that's true. You know, uh, one of the things that we've done recently as we go through this process and these changes and the reduction in, uh, in engine companies is we're kind of tasked with figuring out the best way to allocate our resources. And what's been really rewarding is uh, it's been driven by a consensus uh, through fire fighters and management staff coming together and really looking statistically at the challenges that are out there, both from a fire perspective and an EMS perspective. And we've really fine-tuned it over the last year. And we've been able to identify our weaknesses and really address them so that we can be not only more efficient, um, but smarter with the way we do business. And I think that's what the citizens um, are seeing and are, are feeling. And, and it really keeps our morale high as well, because then our folks go, well, hey, we're doing things the right way, and we're using um, uh, prioritizing using everything we can to figure out uh, the best way to solve the problem so that's been that's been great and uh, you were talking about the safer grant uh, two million a year with 12 firefighters how long will we continue to get that grant so that grant is actually two grants we were we were awarded one grant for three and then one grant for nine and uh, they're two-year grants and uh, again they're federal grants and the good thing about federal grants is they want to get that money out there. They realize that the cities and the counties are suffering right now with the bad economy. And we all are. We see it out there on a daily basis. So they really wanted to ensure that we're prepared in case of an emergency on the street level. So those two grants will last two years. Uh, however, we can put in for extensions. We can ask for more time. And we will definitely do that and we're actively pursuing more grant funding. We just recently uh, submitted our latest grant for nine more firefighters for two more years, uh, and that we got the highest rating, uh, which when that gets reviewed, we are right up there with the best of them, and we may get another nine. 
So we're not only doing, we're not only being smarter with our resources, we have great folks in the firehouse that are spending their time figuring out how to solve the problem, which is get the service out there to the citizens. And if we're able to get that grant as well, we're really um, putting Vallejo in great shape to respond on a daily basis to fires and emergency medicals and rescues. Now, uh, just for our audience, uh, to get a little feeling for the kind of work that our <coughs> fire department does, um, there's a separation between the types of call for service. We have the fire calls and then the other kinds of emergency calls. And typically, isn't, aren't the fire calls about one-sixth of the total volume or something along those yeah, lines? Yeah, you're, you're right about right. It's right uh, depending on the year. Um, the fire calls, we consider any fire. Uh, to be a fire call, so it could be a vehicle fire, it could be a, a you know a stove fire, or it could be a you know what we had at the Mare Island uh, yeah. um, building, which was 300,000 square feet. Those are all our fires, and those are typically running in Vallejo around 15 percent. Sometimes it can get close to 20 percent, and you're absolutely right. So it's a smaller percentage. Um, the only thing uh, that is deceiving is we run over 12,000 calls a year now. Our call volume continually rises, and so at 12,000 calls, you can kind of start doing the math and, and, and figure out, wow, you're over 1,000 to 2,000 fire-type calls a year. So uh, that's a lot, and the reason this city um, tends to have a large number of fire calls is because of the age of the structures. Number one, we have a, a, a rich history in Vallejo with a lot of incredibly beautiful buildings and architecture, but it, they're... they're they're old, you know, and, uh, and when you have old buildings, you have old electrical, and you have a lot of challenges with that. So we get a lot of fires that way. And, uh, and it's a challenge, but it's something that we take a lot of pride in uh, because in the county, we run more fires per firefighter, and I would probably venture to say in the state, some of our engine companies are, are up there in the top um, most busy fire engine companies in the state as well. And that's... Uh, a good and bad thing, we don't like to see people suffer, but at the same time, this is a craft and a profession, and our guys really enjoy getting out there and making saves and stops on fires uh, because it's what they signed up to do. So, And, and one other thing that um, a lot of times people don't recognize is Vallejo is, is considered to be an urban city, and because of that, we have different requirements. We even have, or had, didn't we, a, uh, a uh, firefighting vessel a boat that yes. we could actually take over through the Napa Straits? And yes, yes. We had two boats, actually. Uh, and um, right now we're down to one boat. We call it the Neptune. And that boat is, um, is valuable for a lot of reasons. Uh, the main one is that it can pump over 1,000 gallons a minute. So if we have any fires out on the Straits, we can respond effectively and make a difference. From a rescue standpoint, all our folks get water rescue training and have water rescue equipment on the engine and truck companies. So that tends to be more of a land to, to water effort. Uh, and we have been challenged from a boat perspective of keeping it in the water and having people that can staff it regularly. So that tends to be a dynamic staffing issue where we staff it uh, when necessary, when it gets warmer, there's more people on the water. And we're currently working with Benicia to try to work with them to utilize that boat for both cities and do more cooperative efforts to get that boat out there without causing uh, unnecessary funding. So, And nowadays it seems like collaboration and cooperation and partnerships are the direction a lot of people are going to combine resources and get efficiencies of scale, try to help cut the overhead. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's a difficult task. You know, everybody's got their um, mentality of how they want their uh, turf to run, and, uh, and so that, there's always challenges there, but for, for me personally as a fire chief and, and my vision, um, I realize that when you have neighbors like Benicia and American Canyon where you have already automatic aids set up because they'll come into our city when we're um, on a fire and we don't have any coverage, they'll come cover our city and we'll vice versa do that for them. We are always looking for ways to trim the fat, so to speak. There's not a lot of fat out there now, but if we can create those efficiencies, suddenly um, both departments and the citizens end up uh, benefiting. So the fireboat's one perspective. 
Um, and we're looking at other areas um, as we speak. I'm in meetings uh, all the time to look at different areas that we can combine and just work a little bit smarter on. Well, one area it seems like um, a lot of different cities and municipalities and counties get together on is emergency preparedness training. Yes. Now, we have a program that uh, you're kind of supporting or doing training on or helping to implement. Could you give us a little background on that? Yes. We have um, what's called a Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT is the, is the acronym. And the CERT teams uh, have been around for a while, but uh, due to funding or lack of funding, we haven't been as aggressive as we probably should have or could have been in the past. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to get grants to help sustain and start funding that again uh, from the county. And what those are, those are community teams of, of people in the neighborhood that can come and get training, a six-week program, four hours a week. They can be trained on the basics during a major emergency or, or disaster. Mm -hmm. And that's so important uh, from the fire uh, perspective uh, because we are 15 to 18 a day for a population of 120 to 130,000 people. And as we've all seen in the world uh, emergencies and tragedies and, and disasters, as well as the national disasters, there's just not enough staffing from a fire and police perspective. So what we do is we utilize those teams to train themselves to be able to take care of their own homes, their own neighborhoods, their own blocks. And then that training goes a little bit further and allows them to be part of the solution, whether they're triaging and looking at medical conditions of patients so they could report back to us to kind of prioritize a disaster. All those areas is what they help us out with. So that's been a, a big benefit. Um, it's something that I'm passionate about. Uh, we have great citizens. We have two classes going on right now. And my vision is to sell that program as much as I can and get people interested, trained, and our vision, our long-term vision is to bring together block captains, neighborhood captains, so that when it does happen, it's not a matter of if, and we all know the earthquake uh, um, issues we have in the San Francisco Bay Area. When it happens, we have a plan, and that's better than having no plan at all and just being reactive. We want to respond to what we need to, you know, to handle. So that's a great program. We will continue to do it as demand exists, and, uh, um, and it's really kind of the rubber meets the road for our citizens and our neighborhoods. Uh, secondarily to that, would you like me to talk about, since we're at the senior program, I wanted to talk about the new uh, class that we have, which is Senior Cert. Yeah, I wanted to, if we could, cover that a little bit and also maybe just let people know if they're interested in getting the training or having their organization trained. Yes. How they would contact you to do that. Absolutely. If you go to our website, we have a, a CERT email. So you can actually go to the city's website, go to the fire department, and what you can it, what find... What is the city's website? Uh, it, <laughs> it's a, if you Google Vallejo, you'll be able to okay. pull it up. Okay. And I apologize for not knowing that. Um, but it's a, a www.vallejo.org, I believe. Okay. But I would double check that. Don't hold the fire chief to that. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to bring up, actually, because you made a great point as, during our discussions, you brought up a, uh, um, a fantastic idea. So I got to give you credit for it, Tom. But, okay. uh, but we have the Senior Cert program, which you can sign up for through the website as well. And the Senior Cert program is a, is a shorter version. It's not a six-week program. But what it does is it identifies our, our greatest concern during a disaster, which are our seniors. There's two areas that we, we're concerned about. We're concerned about schools, obviously, so school-aged children, and our seniors, because they're the most at risk. So what this program is, it's a four-hour program, but it can be condensed. And what we do is we teach seniors how to secure their homes, their residences, make sure that they have the proper amount of food, water on um, uh, available and they can take care of themselves. We're not worried about them going out and being neighborhood captains. We just want to make sure that they're safe in their homes until we can actually make a difference for them. And you brought up, excuse me, you brought up a great point, which was maybe we could video a half hour segment to go over the basics 
of the senior cert for the show here. And uh, we're looking forward to doing that with you mm -hmm. as the host. And we already have plans in place after, we, after our discussion to bring the, the crew down to the fire station and kind of walk through the different areas um, in a quick half hour segment so that the folks at home can mm -hmm. see kind of the necessities and the, and the areas that they should be concerned with. Yeah, well, that, that would be great. Yeah. So that's a thank you to you. <laughs> well, that, that's okay. So uh, one, one of the things that was also a part of that was the concept of train the trainer. Are you still doing that kind of thing where you go out and you train leaders in different groups and then they have the ability and the motivation to go and train another group of people and another group eventually? Absolutely. In theory, you have the whole community ready to go. Well, and that's it, too. That's kind of where we're going. One of the things, train the trainer does take a, um, a, a level of commitment of being trained to a higher level. So we are always offering that because it's twofold. Our reality is we only have so much staff, so many staff members that can teach this, these, these areas of expertise. If I can get community members that can also volunteer to teach, I can make the limited funding go a lot farther. Mm -hmm. And we'll host them at the fire department and continue down that path of, of working with the community and utilizing the community to do exactly what you're talking about, educate more and more people. Mm -hmm. We also are proud to, to uh, have worked with uh, and continue to start to work with the Red Cross. The Red Cross is a great organization with incredible volunteers that I've met with personally and I'm just so impressed with. And they've come uh, stepped up to the table and said we want to be a part of this and that's just you know for me it's a great thing it's a great thing for our cert um, coordinator and our trainers to be able to utilize their expertise on some different areas and get that training out to not only to our staff the community so we're partnering with as many people as we can so that we can get a synergy going and get this thing moving in the right direction and not just a little bit but make it go a long way and uh, I understand that um as a testament to the city's commitment to this, the, uh, the city manager, Phil Batchelor, who is sort of still with us, but we have a new guy there, there in transition, uh, made arrangements for 20 or so uh, managers from the city to go to training in San Luis Obispo? Yes, um, we have, there's a 40 hour disaster preparedness class. Uh, and really it should be required for all city staff because uh, what, what happens in cities is people just think that the fire department's going to handle everything or the police department's going to handle everything. And the reality of it is, is the fire department's going to be overwhelmed operationally. So operationally speaking, they're absolutely right. We're going to be out there doing everything we can and, and requesting resources to help us operationally. But there are several areas of a response to a disaster that is required by the city, by all staff members. Um, Public Works becomes a big player when you're dealing with collapsed buildings and roads and, and waterways and all the things that might happen um, and negatively impact the infrastructure and the citizens. We need to tap into Public Works. We need to tap into finance because finance has a requirement to document funding. Uh, everything we spend, they have to document. And if they don't document it per uh, the proper protocol, the federal money won't come to us. So there are all these areas you think, the, why is a finance person being trained? Well, if we don't have our, our, our I's dotted and our T's crossed, it could cost the city $10 million, as opposed to being funded by the federal government properly during an emergency. Mm -hmm. So that was a great exercise. It really um, showed the commitment of the city to the citizens and, um, well, created a level of teamwork you got to be with people in other you know other other departments that you didn't usually work with and it was great for for camaraderie and, and teamwork building it was great for an eye-opening exercise for people that went wait a minute this is my requirement I didn't know mm -hmm. that this was my role in an emergency so that's been a, a great thing and I give credit not only to Phil Batchelor but Dan Keene the new city manager has come in and he is um the baton wasn't passed. I mean, he was running with it. And he made it very clear to, to, to me that his goal is that we continue with CERT. We continue to get our people trained and prepared to respond to emergencies. So it's been a smooth transition. 
there's complete buy-in by council members who've done a great job and also by the city, current city manager as well as Phil Batchelor. So it's a good thing and I think that um, I'm really proud of, of, the, of, of the department heads and all the people in the city that went to the training. So we have uh, more to come on that one. Uh, another thing we had talked about was CPR Saturday. Yeah, C CPR Saturday. <laughs> CPR Saturday is a great program, you know. Um, and that's not for somebody that overdid it on, on Friday night. No, no, no. Friday. CPR Saturday is not <laughs> a, a pill that's going to cure everything. But <laughs> okay. CPR Saturday, the great thing with CPR Saturday is a lot of people think, I got to go get CPR certified and I got to go to a 16 hour class and I have to take all these tests and I have to be certified to do CPR. When in reality, what's happening is the industry are, are, is changing a bit. What they're finding through technology and studies are simple things that the community members can do out there to make a difference in somebody's life rapidly. So CPR Saturday is a two to four hour program. Now this program deals with no certifications. You're not going to walk out with a card, but what it's going to teach you is what to do in those first couple minutes mm -hmm. and what has been um, what has changed is in the past we wanted people certified we want them to give respirations to somebody who's had a heart attack when we wanted to know, them to know exactly how to do CPR what they found is if I just teach you where to put your hands on somebody to do chest compressions you can get oxygen that's already in the blood flowing to the brain because that's what we want to do we want to keep that oxygen flowing to the brain for as long as we can until the fire department gets there or your ambulance company gets there and they can actually start putting air on oxygen and drugs and life support uh, systems whether it's whether it's uh, drugs or um, a medical interve intervention or a defibrillator so until that happens if there's no defibrillator and nothing there if I continue to do compressions until somebody shows up I actually extend that that person's time to or survival time and different studies say different things, but we're confident that you can get a minute to three minutes more on somebody's life. And I bring that up because typically what you'll hear out there is the brain stays alive for four to six minutes. And it typically takes us less than seven minutes to get to your, to your home and to get you the care that you so need. So you add the two together. So you start adding the, the two together, and if I can get two to three minute lead time, suddenly I'm at your house in five, six minutes. Really, it's, we've condensed that time. We've shrunk our problem is what we're trying to do. Um, and and we, we're giving our firefighters and our, our uh, paramedics a better chance at saving that patient. And that's so, our concern right there. So, so um, where and when is this? So CPR program? Saturday, the first one we did was at the Florence Douglas um, Senior Center. We did that one, I believe that was in uh, the beginning of March. Great success. We had several people there. I think there was, uh, we were expecting, I want to say 30, and we ended up with 75 folks. And uh, what we want to do is get the word out there. Uh, again, this is on our website. You can go on our website and request information. But we want to get the word out there for our seniors so they can get those basics down for a couple hours, and they can make a two or three minute difference in somebody's life and that's a, that's a big deal for us and you'll see more and more information about CPR Saturdays coming up in different areas we're going to um, be going to different convalescent homes and assisted living facilities to make sure that they get the training specifically targeted to those areas and then that'll also be on the city website the website will also put it out with press releases and um, and emails and all kinds of stuff so Great. And council meetings. Great. Um, one thing that I know that you're working on, um, and, and it's kind of bringing something back that we used to have as a reserve program, and I think you're putting a little resident element into it. Could you give us some detail there? Yeah, yes. Uh, one thing we did years ago, we did a trainee program. And uh, for some reason over the years, Vallejo has never been a big reserve volunteer firefighter type city. Uh, for a lot of reasons, and, and, and some very reasonable, um, and the thought process was we don't want volunteers running into building, burning buildings and getting hurt, uh, because uh, there is a level of professionalism and expertise and training that takes place in order for our folks to do what they do. But our, our thought process in the fire department now is let's tap into people. 
that want to be firefighters. They have a passion for, for this business. They want to get experience. Let's bring them in because there are a ton of things that we need done in the fire department, as you were talking about earlier. We're doing great in our response. It can always get better as far as emergency medical uh, uh, responses and fire responses. But from a public education standpoint, when we talk about the CERT program, we talk about CPR Saturday, we talk about going out and educating our kids, we don't have as much time for those things. So we can bring reserves and volunteers in from the community, uh, be a part of their work experience as they are working towards becoming uh, firefighters and utilize them as a support service as well as train them at the same time to bring them up to a level that uh, is professional and, and can be contributing uh, from that support service. Our goal, speaking of residents, is to first give, give that opportunity to our citizens in Vallejo. We want to make sure that we remember them first. They're the ones we protect and serve. We want to give them the first opportunity to come in and to, to uh, benefit from that program and that training and serve their community because that's what most people want to do anyway. They want to serve their community. Uh, that's the number one goal. We will take people from outside Solano County, depending if uh, outside of the city in Solano County, depending uh, on our response, obviously, because we want this to be successful. But the citizens are first. We want them to be, uh, have a vision of becoming a firefighter. Uh, we want them to be working so that we can help them develop, mentor, and coach them to become firefighters. Mm -hmm. And it will allow us to save the city a, a lot of money by seeing them firsthand, seeing how they act and react, how, they're, how they do in training. We can tear down a lot of the question marks and risk in hiring. So uh, we've hired great people. We've been very successful in our hiring practices. But, boy, it's nice to see somebody on the job. Mm -hmm. and see how they react and see how, they're, how they handle their, their, um, their duties. And it gives you a real clear indicator of how, what kind of firefighter they're going to be. And really, we have standards in our department that are very high, and we definitely would love to have that opportunity to see that. So it's twofold. We are able to provide more service to the citizens, and also from a selfish perspective as a fire chief that has to hire people, mm. it makes me look a little bit better when I can have a little bit more insight into somebody and make good decisions and... Uh, and get the right people in the positions that need to be there. Well, it sounds like a great program. Yeah. We have a little less than a minute left, and I thought maybe uh, I'd give you a chance to wrap up um, and share with us anything that you wanted to. And uh, one thing you had mentioned was uh, we have a, a, uh, a training center we're looking at on Mare Island. But uh, short of that, maybe you can just give us the wrap up. Well, I'll give you the wrap up. We do have a training facility on Mare Island. We have a great training going on with our new recruits. We have a high caliber of people coming through the door. Our guys are honored to serve the citizens. We'll continue to do that with passion, dignity, and honor. And I want to thank you for having me here today to talk about that. Hey, well, well, thank you so much. Uh, I know the city is really lucky to have a guy of your caliber at the helm. And uh, I know we'll have you back again sometime, uh, talk about anything new that might be going on with the fire department. So uh, thanks again for your time today. And Keep up the good work. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate Thank you. it. Nice, kind words. Sure. And uh, that's about all the time we have for today. Our show airs at uh, 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays on Comcast Channel 27, AT&T U-verse Channel 99, and we're streaming live video. I believe it's vcat.org. Come and see us again next time.